that's kind of conversation between the soul. That's conversation between the soul and the night. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with Derek Davison, and we are excited to be joined today by my friend Rob Carl. Rob is a professor of arts and humanities at Minerva University, and he is also the author of Forgotten Peace, Reform, Violence, and the Making of Contemporary Columbia, which is the book that we're going to talk about today. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Danny, thanks so much for the invitation. Derek, it's great to be here with you, too. So why don't we just dive right in. Um, as we were talking about before we got on mic, Rob, we were hoping you could set the stage for the traditional story that your book's telling doesn't necessarily, you know, try to totally replace, but to, to transform and to change. So that will give listeners a good sense of why your book is important. Sure. So Columbia is usually seen as the outlier within Latin American history. So it's often people who don't study the country have a hard time understanding what's going on. And one of the reasons that's generally pointed to for that is the persistence into the 20th century of the two political parties from the 19th century that had their origins in the first decades after independence in the 1820s. So these are the liberal and conservative parties, Big L, Big C. Those aren't sort of accurate political labels in a lot of ways. The liberal party was indeed more small L liberal than the conservative party, but there were, you know, I guess we could call them like blue dog liberals uh, in the American parlance. So these political parties are seen as sort of replacing the locus of national identity in Colombia. So you're very strongly identified according to the traditional narrative as a member of the liberal or conservative party. It's sort of handed down within families. So the middle of the 20th century sees Latin America's worst civil conflict in the middle part of the 20th century, in the post-1945 period. And it's seen as a return to the partisan wars that the liberals and conservatives fought in the 19th century. So it's very much seen as a sort of atavistic, atomistic conflict that no one else in the region can make sense of. Um, and this period is known as la violencia, or simply the violence, and it's usually capitalized, capital L, capital V. And my book is, in a lot of ways trying to place uh, Colombia within larger hemispheric and global processes, but then also helps to explore the origins of that, that hegemonic idea that we have of mid-20th century Colombian history. So explaining how the term La Violencia with capital letters came into being, because it wasn't a term that people were using in Colombia as the conflict's going on and from the sort of mid to late 1940s until the late 1950s, perhaps the tale of it stretching into the 1960s. And alongside this story, which is in part a story of urban intellectuals and their dissatisfaction with the political process, uh, this process of democratization, reformist democratization in Colombia after 1958, Alongside the story, we can actually find the origins of the FARC insurgency. So the, until its demobilization in 2017, following the 2016 peace accord, the largest and oldest uh, guerrilla movement in Latin America. So I really try to tell an integrated story between these urban intellectuals, urban politicians, but then also rural folk and even rural intellectuals uh, and the ways in which they're sort of talking about democracy development and especially peace and violence from the late 1950s through the mid 1960s. Why don't we then start with the story for listeners who might not be familiar with Colombian history? Uh, let's start in the middle of the 20th century and what has been going on. What is the background that people know to understand what you're talking about in your book? Sure. So I will rewind a little bit. So over the course of the 19th century, there are these wars between liberal and conservative parties. Uh, and these sort of culminate in 1886 with a capital C conservative constitutional project. So the, the conservatives win a, and factions of the liberal party with them win a civil war. They impose this very centralizing pro-Catholic church constitution. And that the easiest narrative is that that kicks off a period of what's known as the conservative hegemony, which lasts until 1930. Uh, the liberals after 1910 are made sort of junior partners. You have the rise of coffee cultivation. I think that's one of the two commodities that people most associate with Colombia, right? And that's a story that 
originates in the early, really the early part of the 20th century. So this conservative hegemony goes up until 1930, when you have a rift in the conservative party over the question of the 1930 presidential election. And this is sort of one of my iron rules of history. If you want to understand sort of when a lot of stuff is happening, when disorder breaks out, when there's conflict, just know when what the presidential election cycle is, because there's usually some sort of conflict uh, around that moment, which made the 20. You know, I felt as if in 2020 in the U.S. election, I was really seeing that dynamic uh, play out in a way that felt familiar as a scholar of Latin America. What is the Colombian political structure? We've talked a lot about this sh- on the show about Mexico and Mexico as a famous six year term, but I don't know about the Colombian political structure. Could you just let me know personally how does it function? What is the separation of powers? What is the presidential system, et cetera? Sure. So Colombia had a federalist system throughout much of the 19th century, much like Mexico. But rather than um, sort of arriving at a new federalist order, as, as Mexico does in 1917 at the tail end of that country's revolution, Colombia arrives at this centralist project. So Colombia is often referred to as a country of regions. So the question of political power and how it's distributed is is really, really essential. So I think a lot of listeners to the show may know Colombia's reputation as a failed state, this sort of, you know, early 20th century notion. That's problematic for a lot of reasons, but there's not a lot of power concentrated within the Colombian state. It has to sort of share out power with other institutional bodies. So the Catholic Church, for instance, uh, after a concordat in the 1890s, really governs the better part of Colombia, what were largely indigenous areas, particularly in the country's eastern two-thirds. The church also has control over education. So it's a very hierarchical system from 1886 until that constitution is replaced in 1991. So it's an interesting mix of sort of stronger presidential power, I would say, very centralized. So up until the 1980s, for instance, there are no direct elections for governors or um, county executive, for mayors either. The president appoints the governors, who then in consultation with the parties appoints the mayors. So you have this interesting sort of hierarchy on the one hand, but then also this the sort of the state apparatus is itself not very strong in most areas. So you have uh, these power sharing agreements with institutional actors, private actors at the local level. There's a lot of political bossism and that way it sort of looks a lot like Mexico up until, you know, the centralization of the post-revolutionary regime as we get into the 1930s and, and beyond. And that centralist structure, this system of appointments really leads to a lot of clientelism and armed clientelism at that. So one of the um, aphorisms about 19th and 20th century Colombian politics is uh, to govern is to appoint. Gobernar es nombrar. So there's a sense that if you are elected into political office, you need to return those political favors. You're going to get constant requests from party faithful to, you know, appoint my cousin to this. I want this position and so on and so forth. So, Rob, first of all, I, I want to specify for the listeners that when you, you talk about the 2020 election, you mean that it was stolen from the rightful winner, obviously, <laughs> Donald Trump. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, secondly, I, I, I actually wanted to follow up on this, you know, the idea of the way Colombian politics is structured. And because one of the things you mentioned in the book uh, is y- you try to take sort of a regional view of things. And I, I get the sense, and I mean, Colombia, as I said to you earlier, is, is sort of a black hole for me. But I got the sense that that there's some tendency in the historiography to kind of go department by department, you know, and get bogged down in like these sort of more local units. And you're, you try in the book to, to sort of uh, get a level above that. Can you talk a little bit about those dynamics? Yeah. So that's not only a, a tendency sort of within the historiography, but as I argue, the sort of regional specificity has like a lived administrative character to it. So one thing I talk about a little bit early in the book and then, and then later on as the action proceeds is that, I mean, Colombia is a very legalistic country. So like army units were generally until the 1960s very bound to their administrative territory. So if we were to carry out an armed raid, I don't know, Russell Cattle or something, and the army was chasing us, they basically have to stop at the at the state line and we could just keep keep going. So that's sort of, again, that sort of lived administrative boundedness is also reflected in the historiography. So one of the things I try to do with the book is play around a lot with scale. So treating the national level in two ways. One, as through the national state, 
in Bogota um, and the ways in which the state is enacting policy, what's happening at the upper levels of politics, but then also national as, as in the sum of the regions. So I think this is a this was a very helpful way for me to sort of get beyond the traditional historiography and account for what I was finding in the archive, which were all these stories that would have maybe traditionally been treated separately, but they're actually intertwined as people move across, people and ideas and goods move across these traditionally very bounded regions. So why don't we return now to the story that I so rudely interrupted, which I believe we're now in the 1930s. Right. So this conservative hegemony of the 1880s up until 1930 is replaced by what's known as the Liberal Republic. So the Liberal Party comes into power from 1930 until 1946, um, so four presidential cycles. And to go back to the comparison with Mexico, Danny, this, in a lot of ways, the Liberal Republic looks like sort of a light version of what Cárdenas is doing in Mexico. So you have an inward-looking industrialization policy, not on the scale of what Mexico or Brazil or Argentina is doing, but actually there's a sort of relative to Colombia's own terms, there is a lot of economic development, industrialization, which leads to urbanization, new groups within politics, sort of a lumpen proletariat that doesn't fit very well into the traditional party structure. A different way of saying this uh, is that universal male suffrage is enacted pretty early in Colombia in the 30s. So you have this new base of voters that the Liberal Party tries to mobilize in its favor. You also have labor unions brought onto the scene under the Liberal administration. So the Liberal Party is really trying to build sort of maybe what we, I don't know, a new you know, what FDR was able to do with the New Deal in terms of building a popular and lasting base of support. And this drives the conservatives insane. And you also see 19, um, there's a constitutional reform in 1936 that reestablishes the separation of church and state, which had been in the Constitution before 1886. It was then taken out by the conservatives. A lot of the global politics that people know from the 1930s, so you know, the rise of communism especially, less uh, the rise of fascism, um, the Spanish Civil War, actually the influence of the Mexican Revolution as well, these are seen by conservatives especially as signs of what Colombia has ahead of it. So you have sort of a radicalization of an increasingly disciplined conservative party under the leadership of Laureano Gomez, whose nickname is The Monster. And he is this sort of brilliant orator and intellectual. His family runs a newspaper. Um, he'd been a thorn in the side of his own party elite the prior generation in the 1920s. And he's really driving a lot of the polarization and it's actually, it's not sort of two sides ism. It is really the radicalization of the right wing party. So that's increasingly the story in the 1930s and the 1940s. And to make a long story short, the actually, again, to go back to Cardenismo, which sort of has its radical phase in the mid to late 19 or in the late 1930s, and then the revolution goes in a conservative way. Very similar thing happens with the liberal republic. So the most radical period is from 1934 to 38. And then you've got increasing liberal infighting and the government begins to tack more to the center. Actually, one thing Laureano Gomez talks about is election fraud. So he talks about a million fake uh, voter IDs and the fact that the Liberal Party isn't legitimate because it's been elected by fraudulent means. See, I bet, I bet the governor of Georgia didn't take his phone calls either, probably. So much like happened in the Liberal Party in 1930, when the 1946 presidential administration comes about, there's a split within the Liberal Party. They poll, it's like a quarter million more votes than the conservatives, but because it's a split ticket, the conservatives return to the presidency for the first time in, in 16 years. And this is really the beginning of La Violencia in 1946, because what you have with this disciplined, radicalized, increasingly militant conservative party is this is their chance to sort of root out what they see as communist influence and the pernicious influence of the left. Um, you've got sort of priests cheering this on in a lot of regions. But then it's also that you've got the chance for conservatives to take over all these patronage positions within the civil administration that the liberals have been controlling for 16 years. So you have sporadic outbreaks of 
violence in the provinces. So largely directed by conservative appointees, these sort of proto-paramilitaries, these posses of deputized conservatives um, targeting their liberal rivals. Something like this had happened on a smaller scale in 1930 when, when the liberals had taken power, but it really expands. It's on a scale unmatched in Colombian history beginning in 1946. So that's sort of the rural context. What is Colombia's relationship to the United States? Uh, during this period? Yeah, it, Colombia is throughout the 20th century one of the, the United States' most reliable allies. Well, I should say after, really after the 1920s into the 1930s. Panama had been part of Colombia up until 1903, um, and there's this disastrous, the final big civil war between the liberals and conservatives happens between 1899 and 1902, and that sort of allows Panamanian political elements to launch their own political project, their project of nationhood that's supported by the United States. So uh, Panama secedes from Colombia in 1903. So there is a fair amount of ill will toward the United States. The U.S. pays an indemnity to Colombia in the 1920s, which sort of paves the way for better relations and also helps kickstart some of the economic development that's then going to continue in the, in the 1930s. But one thing to keep in mind is that Colombia is sort of position is the only South American country, even after the loss of Panama, that borders both the Caribbean, the Atlantic, and the Pacific. This gives Colombia a lot of geopolitical weight. So that's a lot of the interest that the United States in particular took in the early part of the 20th century. And that's going to continually be the story, as particularly as we get toward the Cold War and the, and the post-1945 period. And it's geopolitically important, I think, in different ways, too. Like It's a reliably Catholic country and sort of the institutional hierarchy. So when the, the Vatican needs to get something done in Latin America and sort of launch a conservatizing project, like shutting down liberation theologists in Brazil, they're going to lean a lot on the high clergy in Colombia. Similarly, when Ratzinger became uh, Pope Benedict, the guy who replaced him as head of whatever the Inquisition's called today was a Colombian. So there's, there is, Colombia has this sort of hemispheric role in a bunch of different forums. And one other thing about Colombia's geopolitical position is Colombia took a leading part in the creation of the inter-American system, beginning in the 1890s, but then especially in the 1930s. So the first secretary general of the Organization of American States, which is set up in the beginning of the post-war period after 45, the first secretary general of the OAS is, is also president of Colombia during the first half of the period my book looks at after 1948, and he'd been acting president toward the end of the Liberal Republic as well. So Colombia is committed at the founding conference of the United Nations, at the founding conference of the OAS. It's really committed to self-determination, non-interference, and sovereignty. And there are ways in which these sort of ideologies sort of lend themselves to the cementing of U.S. hegemony, even if the Colombians sort of see them in a different light. You know, in some ways, it's sort of a diplomatic counterpart to the economic story that Chrissy Thornton tells in, in her book. I know she's been a guest on the show. So why don't we start now in, in 46, and you're moving now to the urban story. And one of the things your book does is integrate the urban and the rural. I think that's a major contribution that it makes. So I mentioned before the ways in which the industrialization and sort of general modernization of Colombia in the 1930s and 40s created a new urban underclass. This group really finds its political expression in a dissident liberal party candidate named Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, who is not of the sort of upper crust of the liberal party. He's from a more modest background in Bogota. He's darker skinned. He's got big teeth. I mean, the, the liberal press hates him. They really parody these sort of what are seen as more indigenous features that he has. And he's really a brilliant orator um, and very inspiring leader. So among his more popular phrases is the people are superior to their leaders. I am not a man. I am a people. No soy un hombre, soy un pueblo. So he's really beginning to channel a lot of these popular sentiments and unmet expectations. And the Liberal Party, he sort of gains control of the Liberal Party by 1947. The traditional liberal elite has been sort of driven out of the country in, in a lot of ways by the defeat in 1946. And they are broken and they see that Gaitan is the future. And I should mention, he's the dissident candidate, liberal candidate in 1946. So he's one of the reasons that the party splits, but he's increasingly taking control of the party as we get 
toward the later 1940s and the next presidential elections in 1950. So in one other sign of his sort of organizational power and the power of his oratory, he convenes a rally in early 1948 to protest the violence that's going on in the countryside. And it's called the March of Silence. So he convenes 100,000 followers in central Bogota, and he tells them to just be silent as a protest against the conservative regime. And this is one of the most powerful images of Colombia that I have in this time. So we could, a lot of people would group Gaitan as a populist leader um, alongside Perón, Vargas, and, and others in Latin America. But rather than the fiery oratory in this moment, he has such sort of uh, sway over his followers that he can command them to be quiet and they have the discipline to follow. The next big moment in Colombian history and really the big rift in the 20th century for the country is that on April 9th, 1948, in Bogota, actually, as all the top diplomats of the Americas are meeting for the session, the conference that will create the Organization of American States, Gaitan is murdered on the streets of Bogota. While U.S. Secretary of State Marshall and representatives of South American republics meet in Bogota to discuss questions of reconstruction and unity, a leader of the Colombian Liberal Party is killed and revolution flames in the capital. Angry mobs burn buildings, overturn streetcars, and fill the air with machine gun fire, which, of course, brings needless casualties. Not even the visiting American officials are safe during the worst of the struggle for capture of the government until the forces of law and order prevail. Still to this day, I get asked, do you know who killed Gaitan? I think the traditional, under or the general understanding now, it was, a, it was the man who shot him was sort of a deranged, conservative fanatic. But Gaitan is shot on the street and this sort of you know whisper goes around the city that grows into something louder mataron a gaitan they killed gaitan and the they here is both the conservative regime but then also the liberal elite the liberal oligarchy that gaitan had also been very critical of throughout his career so Following Gaitan's assassination, um, Bogotá experiences the largest urban riot in the history of Latin America, what's known as the Bogotazo, or sort of the Bogotá explosion. There's looting and rioting. There's a sort of incipient attempt to seize political power, but the army manages to fight that off and drive the population, drive Gaitan's followers away from the seats um, of power. A lot of the city is, is sacked um, and burned. Actually, Fidel Castro is in town as a young Cuban uh, law student to attend this meeting that's going to produce the OAS. So it's rumored for, for decades afterwards that the Bogotazo and Gaitan's assassination were a communist plot. And hey, look, this Castro guy is there. There must be something, something to this. What also happens, and here's where the, the urban and the rural stories really begin um, to come together, is that news of Gaitan's assassination is broadcast over the radio. And his followers hear it out in smaller cities and towns um, throughout the country, and they rise up against the conservative uh, establishment and its allies. So you have story, uh, priests, some priests around the country are murdered by Gaitan's followers um, in the hours that follow. There's the siege, essentially the creation of, of Soviets, worker peasant Soviets in some industrial centers and, and sort of medium-sized cities around the country. This leads to a massive response from the Colombian state. So the liberal elite isn't really able to step up in a way and take control of this nascent popular power, um, which allows the conservatives, uh, the conservative government to step in. So you see an explosion in repression beginning uh, after in the aftermath of Gaitan's assassination. Why aren't the liberals able to take control? Because it seems to be a story of liberalism across borders. I was wondering what you think. Yeah. I think you know they really sort of are fearful of popular power. Um, in a lot of ways, they're not positioned because they're so divided. So many of them are outside of the country. Not a lot of people would have listened to them. And there's also not sort of the organizational capacity to keep this movement going. And the, you know, the commun the small communist party is also caught by surprise by this, and in a couple isolated places is maybe able to give some coherence to these provincial uprisings, these urban uprisings throughout the country. But it's really sort of a really a spontaneous mass movement that no one's able to channel. So 1946 is the date that a lot of people would uh, cite as the beginning of La Violencia, and it really increases in scope after the Bogotazo and Gaitan's death during this period of, of conservative blowback. The numbers are still a little unclear. I think sort of 
around 200,000 people were probably killed in Colombia between 1946 and the late 1950s. And hundreds of thousands, if not millions, were also forcibly displaced from predominantly rural areas. And this is one of the other stories that my book tries to tell. Colombia today, since the mid-1980s, has one of the largest populations of internally displaced people as a result of the, the contemporary armed conflict. If we look at Colombia in the 1940s and the 1950s, we actually see in some, maybe uh, a rate of forced displacement as a total percentage of the population, similar to what we're seeing today. So these questions of mobility are, to me, really central in a way, even beyond sort of the the death and the you know the physical destruction that we often think about in reference to La Violencia. To me, it's really a crisis of mobility as well. Great. So. I know one of the one of the major contributions of your book is that you focus really on the creation of the FARC. Um, I guess that's in the '60s. So, do you want to tell us the story of what happens in the late 1940s and early 1950s, or are we ready to skip all all the way to the '60s? Well, no, we we can sort of walk that story through because there are some continuities um, from the violence of the '40s and the '50s into what's seen as the contemporary conflict. So, these are a couple other big narratives around violence um, in Colombia. So some people talk about a 50-year civil war beginning in the 1960s with the formation of the FARC. Some people even place more emphasis on the continuities in violence. So sort of say from the moment Gaitan was shot until today, Colombia has been a violent country. So one way we can talk about continuities at a, at a micro scale that has a lot of narrative potential, some explanatory power as well, is this young liberal in Colombia's Western coffee zone, um, who's born Pedro Antonio Marin in 1930, the year of the great liberal victory. And he's sort of a middling provincial liberal in the 1930s and as he's growing into manhood in the 1940s. And he's grown up hearing stories about the ways his liberal family members, his ancestors had fought in the last war, liberal conservative war of the 19th century. And he's sort of moving from town to town as a salesman in the late 1940s. So he's sort of caught up in this conservative backlash that follows the popular uprisings after Gaitan's assassination. So he's sort of moving, jumping ahead from town to town as these sort of conservative posses move through and are attacking and murdering liberals and burning liberal towns. And when Lariano Gomez wins the presidential election in 1950, because in 1949, to prevent the liberals who still held control of Congress from expelling him from office, the conservative president declares a constitutional state of siege. And this is really an important legal and political mechanism in Colombia from the 1940s up until the 1980s, site of a lot of political protests, legal thinking, and so on. So the liberals are sort of blocked out of the public sphere from the end of 1949 and for nearly a decade until 1958, um, sort of the moment my book really begins. Laureano Gomez wins the 1950 presidential election uncontested. And to protest his inauguration, this liberal I've been talking about, Pedro Antonio Marin, gets together with 14 of his cousins, um, and they launch an attack on the one of the local police stations. So you have, really beginning in the 1950s, after Laureano takes power and there's an expansion of the conservative-led repression, you have the beginnings of an armed resistance um, that's increasingly radicalized. So you had Communist Party cadres in the 1930s who moved from the river ports along the Magdalena River, which is Colombia's big arterial waterway. They began organizing among coffee pickers, small farmers, workers on large coffee estates, in the center part of the country. And these coffee workers are increasingly caught up in the conservative repression of the late 1940s. So they head up higher into the hills. And sort of Marin runs into these communist organized resistance groups, and they seem a lot more disciplined and sane to him than, than his liberal cousins. So he falls in with them, and he's rebaptized as Manuel Marulanda Vélez, who was a communist labor leader from Medellín who was murdered by the secret police in the early 1950s. So this, this man, Pedro Antonio Marín, Manuel Marulanda Vélez, who's also known as Tiro Fijo, which is a nickname he actually hates. It, it translates best as Sure Shot. Time magazine had this, the most lo- they really loved Western films in the 1960s. They always translate Tiro Fijo as dead eye, which is a detail I love. He turns out to be the founder of the FARC in the 1960s. So he is 
born a liberal, moves to the Communist Party, um, and has, by the time of the Cuban Revolution, comes to power in 1959, a lot of Marulanda and, and the men around him have a decade of rural fighting, of rural combat um, under their belts. And it's really an autochthonous, very, very localized, some relation to the, the Communist Party cadres in Bogota, but really, really tenuous links. Could we talk about who they were fighting and maybe a little bit about the actual ideology? Because this is a moment of, of ideological fermentation for Marxism, Leninism, you've got Maoism. I mean, it's right before Castro. So this is like a big, a big moment. So wh- who are they fighting and what is their specific ideological system? So in a lot of ways, I actually downplay the role of larger ideologies in the book, because I think it's hard, it was hard to reconcile you know, the, the global scales, anything above the national scale, with these more local stories I wanted, wanted to tell. So this is not to say that ideology wasn't important, but it doesn't help us explain a lot of the story. So one of the things that I talk about a bunch in the book is sort of trying to historicize better these partisan identities. So rather than assuming, and they are largely fixed in a lot of ways, you're born a liberal, you're probably going to die a liberal. But there are ways in which that family, your family attachment, your own personal attachment to that partisan label has to be reproduced. And particularly civil wars are a good driver for that. So maybe I talk for a moment about this really fascinating local case that I found in these regional archives it's, that doesn't appear in the book. It's 2,000 of the best words that I wrote for the manuscript that didn't end up in the book. So this tiny town um, in central Colombia and the Department of Tolima, which is the centerpiece of my book, this little town called El Valle de San Juan. In 1930, there contested election as happened across the country. And the local conservatives tried to block the local liberals from being able to vote. Like they just physically barred them, basically, you know, with the threat of violence from coming to the voting place. Now a scuffle broke out, shots were fired, the local the conservatives ran and I think hid in the church and the liberals proceed to to break down the doors with I don't know, machetes, rocks, anything they had. And they pulled out the 80-year-old local political boss who was a colonel from the last war of the 19th century, like totally out of a Garcia Marquez novel. And they they kill him and they just leave his body to rot in the town plaza. And a couple of days later, one of the members of the big local liberal clan walks up, kicks the rotting corpse and says, this is for your killing my brothers in the War of a Thousand Days. So a couple other members of this family had died fighting the conservatives around 1900. And so you see the ways in which that's then reproduced when you have a national level sort of event like an election. It feeds in, it, it worsens these local animosities that exist. Fast forward a little bit. This is getting ahead of the story I was telling, but it's, it's really, really fascinating because this main liberal family was Basque, they have a really, really easy surname to track in the regional archives. So I began to build a database of cases of displacement and also homicide in the later part of the 1950s into the early 1960s. And this little town of El Valle de San Juan has a murder rate in like 1959 of something like 280 per 100,000 people. So, you know, we're talking about northern Mexico, somewhere like Tijuana in the late 2000s, uh, early 2010s. A lot of the liberals who were being killed in this uh, municipality in the late 1950s had been forcibly displaced from their homes, and they're trying to return to their farms in the late 50s. And they're being targeted by the same, a lot of the same conservatives who had driven them off their homes, these family feuds, sort of Colombian Hatfields and McCoys that I was able to trace back to 1930 and then back to 1900. And I have petitions from these displaced liberals about their desire for guarantees from the central government to return home. I can tell you how many members, how many signers of those petitions were murdered over the subsequent two years. So even more members of this Basque, originally Basque family are murdered in the late 1950s. As a side note to the story, I found these in the archive 10 years ago when I went to the, the regional capital. Right after I was there, a, a woman and her two or three kids were murdered someone rolled a grenade into their house and then shot them shot at them as they tried to flee supposedly that hit was ordered by a member of that same liberal clan in a dispute over cattle rustling so that shows the sort of the depth of sort of local political power and also the ways in which sort of these local feuds feed into national political events over the course of the 20th century not constant violence but at certain intervals
So what are the explanations for this sort of violence, even though that story you just told took place in 2012? Why are, is there such violence in the in the 50s and for other particular moments, like you just mentioned, throughout Colombian history? So this is where we might point productively to the existence of ideology, these sort of radical Catholic um, strands that sort of take hold of the, the conservative party in the 1930s and 40s feed into these local disputes over patronage, these existing local feuds between liberal and conservative families. But then you also have the repressive apparatus of the state. So I talked before when I was talking about Marulanda, about these liberals and, and some communists who sort of fled deeper and deeper into the mountains um, of Colombia. There's a military coup in 1953 that dislodges Lariano Gomez from power. And there is a pacification effort in various parts of the country. So there's a bit of a lull in La Violencia from 53 to 55. But then there's a ex- massive military campaign against some of these coffee-producing communities in 1955. And it's absurd. The Colombian army is using tanks in this very mountainous region. The State Department refuses to sell them napalm. So they sort of have to concoct this homegrown napalm that they're launching against this popular movement. And those groups are then going to flee even deeper into the mountains, actually down out of the eastern Andes, down into more of the lowland areas in the uh, eastern two-thirds of the country. And that's another sort of strand in the history of the FARC. So one of the things I try to do with the book, even as I'm documenting these local feuds that, that constitute a lot of La Violencia, we need to think of this period from the 1940s through the end of the 1950s as a period of state violence, largely by the conservatives from 1946 to 1953, and then by the military from 1953 to 1958. So I think that helps to end where I started de-exceptionalize Colombia relative to the rest of the hemisphere. So it's not just the Hatfields and McCoys fighting in the backlands of Colombia, though a lot of that is there, uh, you also have massive state violence similar to what you'd see throughout decades of the 20th century in other parts of Latin America. So, Rob, I think we're in a good place to stop because we're getting now to the the kind of period, to definitely the period that you spend the most time discussing in the book. But I do want to kind of take us out of the military government. So if you could talk a little bit about the kind of winding down of the military government, the 53 to 57, which sort of coincides with the political effort to end this period, La Violencia, and and how those things played out through the mid-1950s. Yeah. So once again, as I've highlighted elsewhere in the interview, the question of presidential succession is really, really important here. So the government that comes to power and the military government that comes to power in the 1953 coup the dictator Gustavo Rojas Pinilla decides as the 1956 election is approaching that he's going to manipulate legal mechanisms to, to perpetuate himself in power for another four years. And between this and an increasingly dire economic situation that extends across Latin America, uh, and then also this sort of horror at the realization of how much fighting has been going on in the countryside, liberal and conservative leaders begin dialogues about forming a power sharing arrangement that will remove the military dictatorship from power. And then also, as it transitions the country back to democracy, we'll try to address the causes of la violencia. So in particular, try to sort of strip out the reasons, the rationales that had driven liberals and conservatives to fight over patronage posts. So this becomes known in 1957 as the National Front Agreement. So under this, the liberals and conservatives agree to alternate presidential power for what turns into 16 years, uh, so from 1958 to 1974. And they also agree to split the bureaucracy evenly. So half the bureaucratic posts will go to liberals, half will go to conservatives. The traditional story is that once this National Front government comes into power, it's sort of those elite agreements are enough to bring an end to La Violencia. What I try to show in the book is how Colombians, not just at the elite level, but out in the countryside, in the provinces, engage in a variety of really novel peace building efforts that coincide with this push towards democratization in 1957, uh, 58. And it's through the disillusionment with those democratizing reformist processes that we get the creation of the term La Violencia by the middle part of the 1960s, and also the formation of the FARC around the same time. That's one of the things I hope we can talk about next time, because this is very interesting. These processes of kind of at the grassroots level, kind of forming, you know, sort of or or finding ways to do 
uh, I don't want to say truth and reconciliation, but that type of kind of peace building effort well before, you know, you have these sort of international uh, kind of, you know, bodies or efforts to to do that kind of stuff. It's, it's a really fascinating part of the book. Um, but I think we'll leave it here for now and we'll get into that. Uh, we'll get into that sort of stuff next time. So, uh, again, Rob Carl, professor of arts and humanities at Minerva University. Uh, the book, again, is Forgotten Peace, Reform, Violence, and the Making of C- Contemporary Columbia. Thanks so much for being on the program. And uh, everybody, go grab this book if you if you haven't. It's a fascinating history of a, a country that I think we should all know more about, frankly. Thanks so much. 